Hello and greetings from UB. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and the UB School of Management, we are delighted you are able to join us for today's webinar presentation. My name is Christy Fields and I serve as the Director of Alumni Lifelong Engagement here at UB. And I'm also joined by my wonderful colleague, Joy Rona, who will assist in answering any questions. We are both so grateful you are able to join us today. Since 1923, the UB School of Management has been developing leaders and making an impact on individuals, businesses, and communities around the world. In their mission to define the future of management, Dean Iyer has unified the school around four distinct areas of focus, business analytics, social impact of management, business of climate change, innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership. Each of these initiatives are helping to realize their vision of a world of transformational leaders and organizations who change society for the better. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome today's featured presenter, Dr. Aditya Wadiantham. Dr. Wadiantham is an Associate Professor of Operations Management and Strategy in the UB School of Management. He holds a doctorate in management from Purdue University and a master's in engineering from University of Michigan. His research focuses on sustainable and socially relevant oper operations with emphasis on clean energy technology development, recycling and reuse in supply chains. In today's webinar, we will look at ways managers can formulate effective business and supply chain strategies that lead to an actionable proactive agenda for sustainability that not only ensures profitability for the firm, but also social and environmental responsibility. We will focus on the environmental impact of the extended supply chain that includes suppliers, third-party service providers, and consumers, and take a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach that includes product design, raw material, sourcing, manufacture, transportation, and storage, consumer use, and eventual disposal and recycling. Concepts will be illustrated with real-world examples, insight from scholarly research and case studies. We will leave some time during today's webinar for Q&A. If you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and submit them through the question section on your screen and send those to us at any time. In addition, we'll be recording today's session and we'll send you all a copy within the next 24 hours. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to our featured presenter, Dr. Aditya Wadiantham. Welcome, Dr. Wadiantham. Thank you, Christy. Uh, and Welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are uh, logging in from today. Uh, so today, uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, a topic which is very close to my research, which is sustainability in supply chains. Uh, and so this is the agenda for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, uh, which is uh, going to be, we're gonna start with an introduction to sustainable supply chains. Uh, I'm then going to go over um, uh, some uh, insights from recent research we have been conducting, uh, which is going to be covered in the first research topic, recycling and closed loop supply chains. Uh, we'll then take uh, a dive into uh, separate, uh, several different topics in sustainability, uh, which I teach in my graduate level class here. Uh, and then I'm going to give you additional insights from another research topic that has recently become very uh, relevant, uh, which I'm working in, which is uh, new business models for a circular economy. Uh, and finally, I'll close it up, close it with uh, um, some emerging issues uh, in the sustainability arena, uh, and then open it up for your Q&A and a discussion around other emerging sustainability issues in your respective industries. So let's start with uh, a brief introduction to what sustainable supply chains are. So uh, I, as I mentioned, I teach this graduate course on sustainable ops. And uh, in sustainable operations, we talk about waste management and other topics. Uh, one of the first charts I show my students is, um, uh, is this uh, chart here, which is showing uh, how municipal solid waste in the United States has panned out in the last uh, you know, five, six decades. Uh, so what you see on the chart on the right is uh, in, the, in the curve in the blue, uh, this is the total municipal solid waste generated uh, across the US. And that you can see has been growing over time. Uh, whereas the per capita generation, uh, which is shown in the dashed curve in orange, 
has stayed uh, fairly flat. Uh, so on a per capita or a per person basis, we are roughly generating the same amount of uh, waste, be it uh, food, um, apparel, packaging, whatnot. Uh, but in terms of the total, uh, our total municipal solid waste generation has gone up. But what is uh, sort of most striking is the chart on the right, uh, which shows the amount recycled. And you can see that um, uh, in the curve in the um, orange here is showing the percentage of municipal solid waste that is recycled. And that was around uh, 6 to 10 percent in the uh, 60s to the 90s, but then there was something happened around uh, the the mid mid 80s uh, that uh, started to uh, shift this curve upwards. So it went from 10 to 16 percent, and today it's about 35, 40 percent on average across all commodities. So then I asked my students, um, and I'll put the same question to you: Is what do you think happened um, between the 80s and the 90s? to sort of spur this big growth in uh, recycling rates. And the answer to that question is, as you may have guessed, uh, is an event that uh, some of you may be familiar with, which was this uh, journey of this barge called the Mobro. And so the Mobro 4000 was a barge that uh, had a lot of toxic uh, medical waste and several other toxic uh, waste materials. Uh, that uh, was generated out of uh, New York City, and it set sail out of New York City because it wanted to, they wanted to find a place to either landfill it or incinerate it. And so this barge had a very infamous um, uh, three-month uh, long cruise, uh, as you can see. It covered various uh, ports, and none of the ports uh, agreed to accept that barge and the waste associated with it because of the contamination concerns. And finally, um, Unfortunately, the barge had to just uh, offload the toxic materials in the middle of the uh, middle of the ocean, uh, and uh, this this received a lot of negative publicity at the time, uh, and led to a, a big uh, movement around improving the recycling rates um, and the recyclability of materials uh, in the U.S. Uh, so this was one such uh, such major event, and you can think of several other events uh, in your in our lifetimes. Uh, that have caused this environmental consciousness among the public. Uh, be it, um, if you're in the Niagara Falls area, you may be familiar with the Love Canal uh, disaster that happened with this um, uh, with this toxic waste that was being dumped under the ground and caused a lot of um, contamination, wastewater contamination, and so on. Uh, there are others such as, such as the Exxon Mobil oil spill and so on. So. Um, these events have, have been occurring over time and uh, they have spurred increasing environmental efforts. Now, companies have uh, proactively started responding to many of these environmental concerns. And what you see here is um, a new approach that has come up in the last two decades, um, where instead of simply focusing on environment uh, economic performance, uh, which is measured by you know publicly for publicly traded companies uh, shareholder returns or uh, net profit and so on and so forth oftentimes uh, today companies are starting to focus more on the other two um, sort of legs of this so-called triple bottom line approach where the companies start to think about their environmental performance and societal or social uh, performance as well and we are seeing that uh, companies are increasingly engaging in environmental efforts and in many cases doing it voluntarily um, to uh, to preempt uh, any future regulations sometimes or sometimes uh, because their consumers uh, are demanding greener products or sometimes it's just more profitable to engage in these waste reduction efforts. Uh, but then they're also going uh, and engaging in more um, uh, efforts to benefit the uh, society through engagement with the local public and uh, and so on. So this new uh, paradigm around the triple bottom line approach has become uh, the norm for many companies uh, today. Now, a conventional supply chain. So this is the uh, this is sort of showing the uh, what we call as uh, the traditional supply chain that has been taught in business schools. For the last uh, about uh, three, four, five decades, and this is you know the forward-facing supply chain, as I like to call it, where companies are purely focused on uh, you know making 
uh, for products, new products, and then pushing it out and selling it to consumers. Uh, and during the process, uh, there is oftentimes uh, significant uh, emissions released into uh, your uh, the air, the waterways, uh, and so on. Uh, and these are called negative externalities because um, uh, the price that is borne or that the price that is charged to consumers oftentimes does not include these environmental costs into account. Uh, for such uh, such an approach, oftentimes profit maximization is the sole objective, uh, but the conventional supply chain now has been uh, appended uh, with a green supply chain, as we like to call it, where companies are increasingly involving themselves in um, recycling, reuse, recovery efforts, uh, where they may perform a life cycle assessment to see which parts of the supply chain um, release more emissions, carbon emissions or other types of emissions into the atmosphere. Uh, they start to think about designing uh, products for the environment. Uh, so designing greener products that are recyclable, uh, that are biodegradable uh, and uh, use uh, less uh, uh, fossil fuels to make. Uh, and then get involved in uh, take back efforts to take back the used products from the consumers and divert these um, used products from landfills into, you know, either, uh, as I said, recycling efforts or uh, re recovery and remanufacturing efforts. And in some cases, repair efforts as well. So this uh, green supply chain has now become the norm in the last decade or so. And uh, uh, in this approach, uh, companies start to take a systems view uh, where they look at different uh, parts of the supply chain and how they can recover value from waste in some sense. Okay. Now in supply chain management, um, and particularly uh, sustainable supply chain management, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues and topics that we oftentimes talk about, we may have heard about in the, in the popular press, media articles, or these are topics that are now uh, starting to become uh, core topics in many supply chain classes uh, in business schools as well, uh, which deal with, uh, uh, you know, greening the traditional supply chain functions like design, uh, returns, uh, 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 recycling, uh, disposal, transportation, warehousing, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so in this talk today, I'll try to cover a few of these topics. And certainly this, all these topics would take a semester long course to really go over into, into detail. Uh, I'll try to give you uh, a flavor of some work I've been doing in some of these topics uh, at the school, along with some topics that I teach uh, in my graduate class as well. Okay, so we'll start with uh, the first uh, research topic, which was on recycling and closed loop supply chains. And this is uh, motivated by um, a work we did to understand, which is in the form of this published paper that you see there, which um, we looked at the impact of um, uh, China's national sort policy on the landfilling of plastics in the United States. Uh, and as you may all know that plastic waste is becoming the emerging issue of our times because they're so hard to, um, to recycle in many cases. Uh, and uh, at, at the university at Buffalo, um, this was motivated by a, a significant grant, a four and a half million dollar grant from the New York State to fund a center which uh, focuses on plastic, uh, plastic innovation and uh, recycling. And uh, this center is a multidisciplinary center that is uh, looking at different aspects of uh, plastic recycling and recently um, about around last year, this was inaugurated by Commissioner uh, uh, Basil Segos, who visited the campus to inaugurate the inaugurate the center. So, as part of this uh, center, trying to look at different ways uh, plastics can be recycled better, um, we were looking at uh, data on how um, the China's national sort policy, as some of you may know, uh, in and around 2017 2018. Uh, China placed uh, an import restriction on all the scrap that is uh, uh, imported from other countries, particularly the, the US. And historically, uh, much of the scrap that's generated in the country uh, in the US is uh, used to be exported to China. 
and uh, many recyclers oftentimes uh, quote the quoted the good prices, the high prices they get for their scrap uh, from some Asian countries. But of late, uh, because of these restrictions, which they call the national sword, and prior to that, that they used to call it the green fence policy. Um, there were significant concerns that uh, the export market is significantly uh, uh, diminished and that we have to find ways to um, improve the, the recycling of these plastics domestically. So what we did in this study is to look at, uh, take the supply chain for plastic into account and look at the impact of this regulation, uh, this uh, uh, restriction on uh, landfilling of plastic. And what we found is uh, right after, so we compared before and after effects, and we found that right after China's national sword, uh, the landfilling of uh, scrap plastic in the US increased by around 20%, um, which was a significant uh, increase. Um, and we were trying to trace the reasons behind uh, that, of course, that we have limited processing capacity in the US uh, for many of these uh, plastics that are generated. And so the research we are conducting at the center is uh, now looking at current processes employed in the US for collection, sorting, recovery, and reuse of plastics. And uh, we are adopting a case study-based methodology uh, where um, we interview companies involved in the plastics uh, reverse supply chain, uh, companies that are uh, involved in processing scrap plastic uh, that in, in any way or form to try and understand drivers of profitability and degree of recycling efficiency. Uh, and on a very high level, uh, this research has brought up some key issues in supply chains, which I'll quickly highlight here. Um, if we take, uh, we, we interviewed a few companies, and if we take the post-industrial uh, plastic reverse supply chain, which in this case consists of a, uh, a packaging uh, food and beverage industry company uh, that supplies to a material recovery facility called uh, also um, the acronym is MRF in the industry, MRF, um, that does recycling of these, uh, of these post-industrial scrap uh, and sends it to a reclaimer downstream. Uh, so in this supply chain, who then sends this re recycled polypropylene that is generated and sells it to end markets. So in this uh, simple, I would say in this supply chain on the post-industrial side, there are some key barriers that exist today. Uh, for example, uh, there are some kinds of plastics that are uh, inherently low value. Uh, and that makes it uh, harder for some of the entities in the supply chain that uh, the sort of the smaller entities like perhaps the MERVs to accept and then find markets for these materials and which makes it harder for the companies to meet their zero waste goals. Uh, we also found uh, there's a lot of cases of sole sourcing or single sourcing. So your company may have maybe a single supplier for many of your packaging needs. Um, and in that setting, it's much harder to be found through conversations uh, to affect changes in this uh, or affect changes at these suppliers uh, in terms of improvements in recycling um, content in the packaging and so on and so forth. Um, and more or less, what we found is uh, typically in many cases, there's a lack of a closed loop supply chain uh, due to barriers such as transportation distances because uh, suppliers may be located out of state and oftentimes it's uh, expensive to transport the scrap material uh, back to the supplier where it can be made into new plastic packaging and so on. So these are a sample of issues that we uh, found uh, when we spoke to a couple of companies in the post-industrial plastic reverse supply chain. Uh, but the issues are a lot more in the post-consumer side, uh, which is our next focus of research at the center, uh, where we're trying to interview companies on explicitly focused on the post-consumer side of recycling and, and, and find barriers to recycling. And, uh, and this is particularly important. Uh, if, you, if you follow the recent news, uh, you, may, uh, you may know that Greenpeace came out with a report that the plastic recycling rates have actually decreased in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it used to be about 10% on average, and now it's about 6 or 5%. Uh, 
um, which makes it an important issue to consider the post-consumer side of things too. So um, just a plug about the research here is please reach out to, to me. I'll provide my contact details near the end of the presentation. Um, if you uh, if you or your company deal with scrap plastics in any way, and uh, it would be great to talk to you about this emerging issue. So I'll now segue into uh, some other topics in sustainability that are of relevance. Um, and some of these topics, as I mentioned, I cover in my class in a lot more detail. Uh, but uh, here I'll just mention uh, some of these topics maybe of for further, uh, further study. Uh, so first of these is uh, we cover this... Um, uh, we play the simulation game in class uh, called Fish Banks. It's a renewable resource simulation game. And there are a lot of learnings uh, to be had from this game. Uh, so in this simulation game, uh, the students in my class uh, uh, play the role of uh, a fishery company where each team uh, decides of how much to fish to catch and things like that in a finite uh, ocean. And... Uh, at the beginning, what we find at the start of the simulation is uh, the resources are plenty. Uh, there are sufficient uh, fish in this particular example in the in the ocean, but uh, uh, close to the end of the game, practically majority of the fish stocks are depleted, uh, and uh, the the resource that is that was thriving at the beginning of uh, the game is close to depletion. And I'm sure that you can relate it to several other um, real world examples where uh, intervention of or, or, or human intervention has led to a loss of biodiversity and has led to a loss of um, uh, a thriving natural, uh, natural uh, population of animals or whatever it is. Uh, and we see a lot of our fisheries today are also close to um, uh, depletion. Um, and so this is tied to a theory in um, environmental economics uh, called the tragedy of the commons and published by this based of a, a based on a research paper published by Garrett Hardin in the journal Science back in 1968, where uh, Garrett Hardin argued that when you have a system where each player or each entity in the system pursues its own self-interest, um, what that does is to um, deplete the resources uh, a lot quicker uh, than if there was more cooperation among the players in the uh, in the system. Uh, and so his quote, uh, as quoted here, is every individual is locked into a system that compels them to increase their production, increase the amount of uh, products they are making in, in this particular context, we're talking about sub supply chains, and do that without limit uh, using up natural resources. And this actually hurts everyone else because the natural resources are common to everyone in the supply chain. That's what we see in the fish bank simulation game as well. Um, and so there's a big need uh, to create uh, collaborative agreements between companies, for example, or voluntary efforts to curb uh, sub carbon emissions and, and so on, which you are seeing today in the form of uh, all the um, uh, country level engagements in the form of the Kyoto Protocol and others, uh, without which um, uh, our uh, emissions levels would be just spiraling out of control and uh, lead to uh, global warming and other effects as well. So after sort of um, uh, Talking about this, we also may talk about um, uh, an emerging issue in supply chains, which is uh, measuring the amount of emissions uh, that is present. And uh, as you may know, um, there are six greenhouse gases, uh, six key greenhouse gases uh, that are tracked in supply chains. And the overall emissions are measured in the form of carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, for many companies today, um, measurement uh, of carbon emissions is, is a key uh, priority. Uh, these emissions could be categorized as three scopes or types. Uh, scope one uh, relates with direct emissions that are emitted by the company's own production plants or company-owned vehicles. Uh, scope two emissions come from purchased electricity 
um, which would in some sense depend on uh, where your operations are, uh, the state where they are, and the clean energy mix in the grid, uh, which your um, operations draw electricity from. And finally, there is the scope three emissions, which are co also called in also an indirect emissions uh, that come from suppliers uh, and uh, waste disposal and outsourced activities and uh, employee business travel and so on and so forth. Uh, product use at the consumer end as well is a big one. Uh, so when we think about carbon footprinting, uh, we refer to the greenhouse gas protocol, uh, which for guidance in terms of how to measure and steps to take in terms of um, characterizing the boundary around which the carbon emissions is being measured. Uh, there are different approaches that companies take to measure carbon footprint uh, and allocate that carbon footprint to their own operations. Um, in addition, uh, 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 scope three reporting. So reporting of scope three emissions is oftentimes optional. Uh, as a result, um, in uh, in many, uh, many companies may choose to disclose their scope one and scope two emissions, but uh, may not disclose the scope three emissions. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, I mean, fortunately, that trend is changing as more companies disclose scope three, but uh, scope three emissions remains the bulk of the overall emissions and supply chains. In fact, um, this um, uh, this picture is showing sort of showing uh, the key uh, uh, categories that cause scope three emissions in supply chains. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, a majority of the scope three emissions may be coming from uh, consumer use or uh, suppliers uh, in terms of purchasing products and so on and so forth. And oftentimes this is very hard to track and, and mitigate in supply chains. Uh, we also uh, should talk about uh, green logistics. Uh, transportation is a key uh, driver of carbon emissions in supply chains or close to 20, 30% of uh, uh, supply chain emissions come from transportation. And uh, companies can adopt proactive strategies, uh, including uh, reducing the distance traveled by their vehicles uh, through efficient uh, um, uh, routing algorithms uh, that reduce congestion and so on, and source locally uh, and so on. Uh, adopting uh, greener modes of transportation, uh, uh, accounting for the trade-offs, such as higher lead times and so on and so forth. Um, adopting better technology for transporting materials like fuel saving technology, uh, hybrid vehicles, and so on. Uh, and finally, planning the, the loads on these vehicles if effectively, um, having flexible delivery time windows, uh, giving consumers a choice sometimes uh, to go uh, to, to get their products delivered through the greener option, and so on and so forth. So these are a host of uh, green logistics strategies. Uh, in addition, uh, one of the emerging issues is also uh, greenifying or um, reducing the carbon footprint in buildings, uh, both residential and commercial spaces. Uh, at UB, we have uh, two uh, um, two buildings, which you may recall from your time spent here. Both Grainer Hall and Davis Hall are LEED certified. Uh, Grainer Hall is LEED gold, gold certified um, and uh, standards like the LEED promote, uh, in many cases, uh, energy efficiency improvements, reduction in water usage, and other um, environmentally friendly initiatives, uh, which is a key pillar of the sustainable supply chains uh, and how to make them more sustainable as well. Another emerging concept we talk about um, in the course, and I'll mention here briefly, is this idea around serviceization, uh, which you may have heard, uh, which is a, a shift in uh, focus from simply focusing on selling products to instead uh, selling uh, services associated with those products. Uh, so there are many examples of uh, companies moving towards uh, product as a service uh, systems, as they are called. And uh, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, many experts in the sustainability area uh, and uh, McDonald and Bronagard are the founders of the C2C or the cradle to cradle protocol, 
And uh, uh, these experts talk about uh, introducing the product as a service where instead of um, assuming all products are to be bought, owned, or disposed by the consumer, uh, the company sells a service associated with that, uh, which the consumers can still enjoy. Um, there are many examples, various examples uh, of this. Um, interface uh, is one. Interface, as many of you may know, is a um, uh, carpet, uh, uh, sells carpets, uh, and they, have moved from simply selling uh, carpets to selling floor covering services where the carpeting solution is, is provided as a lease to the customer um, over a long period or longer period of time. Uh, and um, uh, that allows for selective replacement of uh, these modular um, carpet tiles where the company is going to selectively replace the tiles that actually see more wear and tear uh, rather than the traditional system where you just, you know, throw the carpet or replace the carpet uh, when you see wear on certain parts of the um, of the carpet. Uh, in addition, uh, the leasing model allows the company to um, reclaim the material back. So the consumer sends the used carpet back to the company, uh, which gives a lot more control on um, the life cycle because traditionally, um, uh, I'm sure you're aware that uh, landfilling of carpets is a big issue and there have been legislations uh, that are coming up around uh, banning the landfilling of carpets and so on. Uh, and so that happens in some part due to a lack of control when you simply sell a product to a consumer, uh, a lack of control on the end of life, which can in many cases be mitigated with a leasing arrangement. Another example is Xerox, uh, which used to sell photocopiers, uh, now uh, simply uh, offers a photocopier uh, lease option. They also offer a, um, a service plan around making copies where you pay by use rather than, or pay by printing or pay by copying rather than pay upfront to acquire the machine and then um, and then store the machine in your in your garage once it once it breaks or. Uh, uh, things like that. So a leasing solution helps because these copiers are better, uh, the, the status of these copiers, the, the, the condition is better tracked by the company and, and they get the product back at the end of the lease. So they're able to recycle or reuse them. Um, another example, Dell, uh, instead of selling, uh, they also offer a, a, a leasing option again for their uh, laptops and desktop uh, computers. And I'm sure you can think of many other examples where this is uh, happening. Uh, so uh, such innovative business models can help your company move away from um, uh, move away from a more environmentally um, intense uh, production process to a, a less environmentally intense one and sort of reduce the carbon emissions associated with your uh, overall uh, operations. Um, another quick issue uh, is product traceability, right? We see certifications like um, organic, um, certified organic, or um, uh, Rainforest Alliance certification or Fair Trade Alliance certification. Uh, we want to know whether the the the, the chocolate we are consuming uh, comes from certified cocoa farms or whether they come from uncertified farms. Uh, so consumers are increasingly becoming more conscious about where it is that the materials they are uh, putting into their bodies, where they come from, and whether they are coming from uh, environmentally uh, conscious uh, sources um, uh, or, or not. And so that brings up the big issue for companies around tracing products, uh, so product traceability, and um, what is typically referred to as a chain of custody um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of where the product uh, the materials to make the product are coming from, uh, and uh, this is an emerging issue as well. We talk about this uh, uh, quite a bit in the in the sustainable ops class as well. Okay, now uh, these are a mixed bag of different topics that we talked about, but I I do want to touch base on one more uh, research topic. Uh, uh, that is uh, dealing with uh, new business models uh, for a circular economy. Uh, and this ties in with uh, some of our earlier discussion around uh, the importance of encouraging uh, reuse and resale. And so 
uh, in the current economy, um, this is sort of based on a paper we wrote um, as well called Trade In or Sell in My P2P Marketplace. Uh, but the key motivation behind this uh, study uh, and, and why it's relevant for sustainable supply chains is uh, there is a, a big movement around uh, selling secondhand goods, uh, especially as consumers are, uh, uh, if you look at millennials and uh, Gen Z are increasingly preferring to buy um, uh, refurbished products, uh, pretty, uh, especially in the case of apparel, for example. Uh, so I would perhaps as a millennial not buy a, a new uh, Gucci bag, but I'll buy a, a refurbished one, which is uh, uh, comparable quality, but uh, a more reasonable price. And so um, there are many uh, market reports that are projecting the U.S. secondhand market to uh, reach $70 billion by uh, 2027. And over the last few years, the, the resale as a category has seen significant growth in terms of overall sales. So uh, an emerging question for companies is how do you participate uh, in the resale market uh, so traditionally, resale has been seen as something that is um, hurting or cannibalizing uh, new product sales. Uh, but off late, companies have started to um, monetize the resale activity in their supply chains too. And uh, we see the evidences of this. Um, Patagonia uh, recently opened uh, their first one-ware store where they uh, sell refurbished Patagonia apparel. Uh, alongside their new apparel. So if you go to OneWear and just search for that, you can buy a, a refurbished pair of jeans uh, for about 30%, 20 to 30% cheaper than the new pair of jeans. And uh, because Patagonia has its brand name uh, behind the piece of clothing they're selling, uh, it, you can rest assured it's going to be of uh, good, uh, good quality. Uh, we are seeing similar trends in uh, other companies like REI and Eileen Fisher uh, trying to use secondhand sales to get more uh, new consumers because uh, con as consumers see um, and become more um, strategic, uh, they start to think about the resale value of, um, so if you are, for example, uh, a, 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 a mom, for example, who goes to thread up and sells their used clothes. Um, so at the time of new purchase, uh, the consumer would be um, thinking about what resale value uh, would be uh, obtainable when you finish um, using that, that piece of apparel. And so uh, if you encourage, companies are realizing that encouraging a secondhand market can help them get new consumers because uh, these consumers would get additional value from uh, being able to resell the products at end of life. Uh, Levi's as another example that's trying to buy back and resell old jeans. Again, this is a departure from their traditional business model of selling, uh, simply selling uh, jeans, new jeans. Okay. So the context we were looking at is um, there are different resale oriented business models uh, that would be important uh, for companies to participate in um, to encourage a, a sustainable economy, a circular economy. Uh, and uh, there are several uh, different examples of such models. Uh, for example, companies like Patagonia uh, use a trade-in based resale model where uh, a consumer trades in the used piece of clothing and gets a discount that can be applied towards um, new apparel purchases. Um, and the comp uh, company Patagonia takes back the used clothing and then uh, repairs and refurbishes it and sells it on its OneWare platform. So that could be one type of a resale model. Uh, another one is uh, uh, COS uh, has a different model. COS was recently acquired by H&M. H&M uh, is best known for its fast fashion, but uh, what COS does is different. Uh, COS is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where consumers can buy and sell uh, their used clothing uh, from each other without directly interfacing with the company. Uh, so if I'm a H&M customer, particularly a cost customer, let's say I have a piece of clothing I bought from them and I need to sell them, I just go to the marketplace that a uh, cost has created for me and I sell it. And there could be other uh, loyal, dedicated customers, of course, who are willing to buy that apparel from me and so on. 
So this is another model where resale or reuse is being encouraged by companies uh, and um, and so on. But there are other uh, tr companies too, like Zara, which are still um, focused on the new product sales market and not yet engaging in resale. Uh, but that is uh, that is also changing. So the research question we were looking at is uh, really which model is better for the environment, because uh, 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 both models, whether trade-in or marketplace model, encourage uh, resales. Um, so what we realized is uh, in such uh, cases, it's important to focus on the life cycle, take a life cycle approach on measuring and assessing the environmental impact associated with uh, different models uh, of uh, encouraging resale. Uh, so a typical apparel, for example, goes through several stages where it emits um, uh, some environmental uh, uh, activity has an environmental activity, including emissions, which includes uh, being uh, being uh, made new production, um, which uh, oftentimes uses fossil fuels, um, uh, cotton, for example, uh, uses a lot of pesticides to grow and so on. If it's a polyester based jacket, the polyester is fossil fuel based, so that requires um, some fossil fuels to make and so on. Um, so there is environmental um, emissions from that activity. Uh, in addition, once the apparel uh, has been sold to consumers, um, consumers uh, emit emissions in some sense or, uh, or use electricity to wash uh, the apparel over its life cycle. So if it's something like a piece of uh, or a pair of jeans, uh, that could be washed maybe once in a, a few weeks, whereas something like a dress shirt or something has to be washed more often. Uh, and so these washing and drying cycles would take up uh, some electricity use, which would be tied to some emissions and so on. Um, next, um, if you are reselling the piece of apparel, uh, there's a lot of activity involved with uh, taking the product back, transporting it to a centralized distribution center, um, uh, repairing it, uh, with uh, maybe you replace the zippers and things like that. That's there's additional activity, uh, environmental activity with resale, and eventually they would be disposed. Of course, uh, this disposal could be in the form of uh, landfilling or incineration. But there is an activity, there's an environmental impact of disposal as well. So uh, what we found is taking a life cycle approach helps, and uh, uh, we are able to uh, compare the different business models in terms of their environmental impact. And uh, the long story short, what we find is, and that's been covered in the popular press, um, our research finds that both business models can be uh, better for the environment compared to the other, uh, but it depends. And the answer is it depends, and uh, it really depends on the type of apparel you're looking at. If it's an apparel that requires a lot of uh, production uh, phase environmental impact, uh, the trade-in model may not actually be the best model. Uh, whereas if it's a piece of apparel that requires a lot of washing and drying and consumer use, consumer end emissions, uh, the other business model may be uh, preferable, which is the uh, peer to peer marketplace. So um, I will uh, refer to some of these. Uh, I'm happy to send you uh, links to some of these articles as well. Um, I do want to quickly segue uh, for the last couple of minutes uh, to emerging issues. And I'll sort of highlight three issues and then open it up for your thoughts, discussion, and questions around uh, what are other emerging issues you're seeing in sustainable uh, sustainability in supply chains. But here are three key issues that are becoming more and more uh, relevant as I see it. Um, so the first is, of course, uh, the transition to renewable energy. Uh, and um, many companies uh, which are drawing power from the grid and depending on the power, the, power, the mix of clean energy in the state may be using a lot of uh, uh, coal-fired uh, electricity or even electricity generated from natural gas. Uh, so there's a big push in many states uh, to uh, transition. So New York State, for example, has 100% uh, renewable energy coal uh, by uh, 20, 2040, 2035, 2040. And meeting these uh, renewable energy goals means companies have to find ways to transition away from uh, traditional fossil fuel based electricity uh, and uh, generation to more renewable energy based electricity solutions. And that may involve uh, moving to uh, hydrogen, for example, or moving to uh, renewable natural gas or other solutions. 
So uh, for many companies, this re uh, this renewable energy transition is going to be a key key factor in the in the next uh, many years, and how to affect this transition. Uh, another emerging trend in sustainable supply chains uh, relates with uh, certifications uh, because consumers are now demanding uh, more traceability for their ingredients uh, that they see. Uh, so traceability in supply chains, uh, particularly in like uh, certifications like Fair Trade and Rainforest Alliance, uh, is going to become increasingly important. Uh, particularly because of the supply chain costs. Um, uh, there are different approaches like mass balance and segregated sourcing. It's not really clear which approach is better for the environment. And so uh, companies may need to devote more attention around traceability in the next few uh, years and uh, the next decade. A third emerging issue is around legislations that are now coming up uh, in, in several industries. Um, for example, uh, we are doing some work on uh, tires. And uh, tire recycling has been mostly driven by um, the uh, industry associations and so on. But of recently, there has been more uh, emphasis on regulation, particularly because though tires are collected quite well, we have very high collection rates for scrap tires in, in many states due to the tire fee, which is like the $1.50 fee you pay when you return a used tire and uh, and that's for recycling the tire. But uh, it, most tires that are uh, returned this way are either incinerated, which is tire derived fuel, um, or they are land used as landfill cover, uh, which is not the best use. So to encourage better reuse of these uh, crumb rubber, um, uh, many states are now moving towards extended producer responsibility, uh, acronym is EPR based legislation which will mandate producers to um, collect these uh, scrap tires and then make sure that they're diverted to beneficial end users. And so Connecticut recently became the first state in the US to uh, implement a first tire EPR law. And we are seeing this increasingly in several other categories like pharmaceuticals or packaging and so on and so forth with, uh, with a movement around this. So, uh, so for companies uh, facing environmental legislation is also going to become a norm. Um, as you know, there's a big push around uh, forever chemicals. Uh, so there are many chemicals that are used in products that do not easily, um, uh, are not biodegradable. They, they stay in the body for the long period of time and they are called forever chemicals. And forever chemicals are being regulated in Europe and many other countries today. So facing environmental regulation and proactively responding to it will also become very important uh, to ensure uh, sustainable supply chains. So um, I would like to end by sort of thinking about what are some, uh, um, uh, for you thinking about what are some of the emerging sustainability trends or issues in your industry uh, that that uh, that uh, you would like to uh, bring up and sort of think about uh, and ask questions on and so on and so forth. So let me stop here. Uh, I want to thank you for listening, uh, and I let me turn it over to uh, Christy to moderate uh, any discussion. Dr. Vedantham, thank you so much for spending time with us today. So grateful, so um, interesting, the presentation and the research you've done. So I just have to say thank you, um, not only on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, but the UB School of Management. So really grateful for your time uh, with us. We have some questions. We have a couple comments, um, Dr. Vedantham, that I'll share with you in case you want to weigh in a little bit on those as well. Um, and then if I see any responses come through to what's happening um, in industry from some of our attendees, um, I'll make sure to share that information. So taking a look um, at some of these questions here, um, you talked about the secondhand market and it being 70 billion by 2027. We have leading um, companies that are really well known like Patagonia, you mentioned um, in this refurbished retail market. Um, how do you see this landscape just evolving over the next, you know, maybe two to five years even um, with such a name brand retailer taking the lead on this? So uh, this is an emerging area, as you can see. As you can see, the um, consumers, as I mentioned, are increasingly going for uh, sustainable brands, and uh, they want to. Uh, they are also becoming increasingly price conscious. So uh, I think um, uh, there have been several reports recently around uh, uh, significant amount of inflation and so on, 
that consumers are facing as a result they are reducing their discretionary spending and becoming a lot more price conscious but at the same time they want a high quality associated with the price uh, that they pay and so uh, the resale uh, market efforts them the opportunity to buy cheaper products with um, good quality especially if they are certified uh, by the brand uh, that makes uh, you know durable and dependable clothing like patagonia and others um so um this is a market that uh, is expected to go significantly as uh, as i mentioned um you know uh, price conscious millennials and others uh, become the target market for many of the companies uh, and um, it's not just resale though uh, there are other models uh, like rentals that are also becoming popular uh, there are companies like Rent the Runway and so on and so forth uh, that encourage that uh, or that facilitate that. Um, I'll also say that a lot of um, third party marketplaces that are involved, not just um, main, uh, manufacturer retailer brands like Patagonia. Uh, there are uh, you know, marketplaces like ThreadUp, uh, Poshmark uh, and uh, many, many others uh, that West Air Collective and many others that actually are encouraging uh, this resale. Um, so yeah, I see in the next two to five years, this will still remain a important uh, uh, important area for you know market development and so on for many of the apparel companies. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. It'll be interesting, Dr. Rodantham, to have you back even in a handful of years to see how everything is emerging and progressing. You know, as the research um, kind of states here. So I um, would love to see that even. <laughs> and um, this next question, you touched on inflation. Um, and just being more kind of cautious in our spending. Uh, so taking a look at this, um, when you think about companies and kind of going back to earlier in your presentation, um, and with with, infl with companies facing inflation and really being more focused on their bottom line, um, is it something from a sustainable su supply chain, is it making financial sense to companies and organizations? Absolutely. So I think, uh, as I mentioned, as consumers, as inflation increases, consumers become more discretionary in their spending patterns. Um, they are looking for uh, quality products at an affordable price. And uh, many companies are, uh, some companies are also dialing down on the kind of ingredients they purchase and so on to reduce cost. Uh, at the same time, they want to maintain the quality uh, that is needed uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure uh, the consumers are satisfied with the product. So, um, as I said, this is an emerging uh, issue, not just for the apparel industry, but several other industries as well. Uh, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how um, company strategies change uh, in the next few years as they deal with these uh, these new uh, consumers that are, for example, um, uh, emerging trends around uh, shrink, what they call shrinkflation, uh, which is when consumers in many countries are moving to cheaper pro cheaper products. So, so products with smaller form factors. So let's say, um, you know, especially if you're a price conscious consumer, I'm not going to buy the, um, the, the, the big, big uh, box of lotion or whatever it is. I'm going to go with a smaller one because it's more affordable and cheaper, whatever uh, the reasons behind that may be. So that shrinkflation is another um uh, consumer behavior that is emerging and so uh, uh, for for many companies it'll be important it'll be interesting to see how their strategies pan out in addition to that the sustainability aspects of that will also have to be uh, taken into account for example i mentioned traceability uh, one of the movements uh, that is happening or a lot of companies are arguing for um, uh, a mass balance approach which is a cheaper approach uh, where the certified and the non-certified ingredients are not mixed so um, in the supply chain. So anytime you're uh, sourcing, let's say, uh, cocoa for your chocolate bar, uh, the cocoa can come from certified farms and non-certified farms. Uh, and so for a company keeping the, the certified ingredients and the non-certified ingredients uh, separate is, is a big challenge because you have to have uh, separate production lines. You don't have to mix. You don't. You cannot mix them because then you lose the certification. Um, and so, separate product lines. Uh, you have to have separate uh, uh, 
uh, production runs even, you have to, for example, keep organic separate from non-organic and so on. So this is called segregated sourcing, which is expensive to, um, to, uh, to monitor and expensive to also manage. Uh, so companies, um, uh, some companies are arguing for a mass balance approach where these ingredients are um, uh, sort of uh, mixed together, but you still keep track of the overall amounts that are being used in the process. So on an aggregate level, you know how much certified cocoa is there in your um, uh, in a chocolate bar, or uh, how much uh, sus how much sus sustainable palm oil is there in your bar of soap, or whatnot. Um, and so uh, there will be a trade off between consumer willingness to pay, uh, which as we said is see seen as going down for some products, with um, uh, with the cost of maintaining quality and ensuring sustainability. Yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wadantham, uh, this next question kind of goes back to when you were talking about leasing options, laptop, desktop, copiers, and um, this individual just put a comment in saying companies should do what Dell Computers does when you purchase from them. Um, they provide postage vouchers for you to return your old equipment to them to repurpose or recycle. Um, do you see this continuing to be a trend? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a great suggestion, and this is uh, exactly what Dell Computers does and uh, many other companies are also doing, which is uh, provide um, easier ways for consumers to return the used product at end of life. Uh, oftentimes, consumers are, um, are not unsure what to do with a used product because, uh, for example, a phone, uh, when, it's, uh, when it broke, when it breaks, uh, we typically, uh, the studies will show you just keep them in the house, you keep them hidden away from sight, maybe throw them in the garage because you cannot trash them. You cannot, uh, yeah, there's this, um, there's a, there's this, uh, there's, so for, for firstly, it's not legal to trash and electronic products and things like that, but uh, it's too much of a hassle to return, give it to a recycler and so on. So as a result, there's a lot of stockpiling of these used electronics and things like that. I mean, uh, many consumers' homes, I'm sure you can relate to, have a lot of used phones lying around, uh, maybe a broken um, broken printer lying around somewhere, things like that. So for companies to make it easier for the, for the consumer to return it back to the company through this uh, prepaid um, op option or three pre prepaid mailing option or things like that makes it a lot more easier. Uh, there are companies in the apparel industry that are doing that. So thread up for you, for example, when you buy a uh a new uh clothing new piece of clothing they give you a, a bag uh when which you can use to return the used clothing um at the end of life or you can just order the bag when you need to return them so uh the, these are these kind of solutions are becoming more common as well yeah so that's a great idea Excellent. Um, and just, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. We'll just end another comment here, uh, Dr. Wadantham, that you might want to just weigh in on. Um, one of our attendees, a beekeeper in the U.S., and the traceability of honey is a big concern pertaining to the foreign imports. So imports that are adulterated are flooding the market and lowering the prices. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great uh, comment. And I see Anthony has put this comment up. So I would love to get in touch uh, with uh to discuss these topics more, but you are absolutely right that um, counterfeit items, adulterated items, uh, poor quality are, are actually a big issue. Uh, and uh, traceability of honey is, is certainly a big, big, big issue. And there's additional costs associated with that uh, as well for companies. But uh, counterfeit items are becoming very big in apparel supply chains where you know you don't know whether the piece of clothing you buy is, is, is genuine or not and things like that. But uh, this is uh, certainly an important issue in several industries. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Vadanbaum. And I know you have your email address here. We'll make sure we include that in the follow-up uh, communication you'll receive tomorrow as well. But if you want to have additional dialogue, um, his email address is here for you. But again, I want to say thank you on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, the UB School of Management, Thank you, uh, Dr. Radantham, for joining us. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to just tune in and just learn um, such great information and emerging trends that we all see um, in the near future. So our webinar series will continue next Wednesday. More information uh, to follow in tomorrow's email, including registration. Um, I do want to take a minute just to turn it back to Dr. Radantham for any closing remarks on his side. 
so thank you again, uh, everyone, for listening in. I uh, appreciate all your comments. And uh, if you need to reach out uh, to discuss any, uh, any emerging issues or anything that we can help with at the university, please do. Uh, you have my email address there, uh, and you can reach out to me. Thank you so much for listening in today. Excellent. Thank you again. Thank you all. Take care. Stay well. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.